afternoon, everyone. And uh, we warmly welcome you to Irish West Africa brand, Southwest Nigeria District, March 2024 CPD session, and also uh, our meeting as it may be. Thank you to everyone who has logged on today. And this will be the agenda for the meeting. We're having the welcome address uh, done at the moment. And then we'll be introducing our speaker uh, to every one of us. Our speaker is someone that is well known, one of the founding fathers of the IOSH movement here in West Africa. Uh, and then we'll be having him take over the presentation of the day. He will be speaking to on HSC digitalization uh, as it is, and then we'll be looking at that for a couple of uh, 30 minutes, after which we'll be able to take a couple of questions and then also provide answers to them. Then we will be presenting a certificate to say thank you to him uh, for doing justice to the topic of the day. And we'll be asking our central schools, I'm sure there are updates they need to share at the moment, which all of us need to be abreast with. Then if there are any other thing we need to also look at as a district, uh, then we'll look at it and then we'll be able to uh, bring the meeting to a close. We plan to also stay within the allotted time for this meeting so that we are not taking so much of our time. So I am Joseph on behalf of the Southwest Nigeria District. I welcome everyone to today's uh, technical session. Like I said, it promises to be a wonderful time and I hope a lot of value add-on will be shared today uh, for our professional development. So once again, you're warmly welcome. Uh, David, you will be introducing our speaker uh, and then after which you will have our speaker speak to us. Over to you, David. All right, thank you so much, um, my chair. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you for joining this session. So we have a very distinguished guest with us today. Um, and I'll, over the next few minutes, I'll run us through his uh, profile. So Engineer Cardiff Ode is the Managing Director of Kevron Consulting UK Limited, a company based in the UK, a subsidiary of Kev Kevron Consulting Limited in Nigeria, which specializes in QHSSE training and consultancy services. He is a chartered fellow of IOSH, a fellow of Nigerian Institute of Safety Engineers, and a current registered mechanical engineer. Engineer Kayade pioneered the establishment of IOSH Nigeria Network Group, and in 2018, he became the first African to be appointed into the IOSH Council and first African to be appointed as IOSH Vice President in 2019. He has extensive ex knowledge and experience in management system implementation, process and construction safety management, project safety management, safety leadership, training, research, and publications. Engineer Kaede holds a bachelor degree in mechanical engineering from Federal University of Technology, OERI, and Masters of Science in Occupational Safety and Health from Middlesex University, London. And he has been offering HSE consultancy services to both local and international organizations across Africa and Europe. Engineer Kaede has won several local and international awards, including the Middlesex University Leadership Enterprise and Citizenship Award, the 2016 JCI Top 10 Outstanding Young Person Award in Nigeria, and IOSH President's Distinguished Service Award in recognition of his significant contributions to the field of occupational safety and health. Engineer Kaede has active interest in writing articles on diverse OSH issues, speaking at conferences, and mentoring young occupational safety and health professionals towards achieving the prestigious chartered membership of IOSH. He is an appointed member of the advisory board for the Association of Nigerian Women Safety Professionals. He was the immediate past NICFTE Lagos chapter chairman and, present, and presently the national vice chairman of 
NICTE. Angela Kayade is a registered consultant in Lagos State Safety Commission and a doctorate candidate and visiting lecturer at the Center for Occupational Health, Safety and Environment, University of Port Harcourt. Uh, please join me in welcome, welcoming him as he takes us through his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's nice to be here once again. Please, can you confirm you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Loud and clear, sir. OK, thank you. Um, while I share my screen. OK, once again, thank you for, for joining me today. Um, today, I'll be talking about um, HSC digitalization, uh, which is known as a global strategy um, within our sector today. Um, Globally, um, things are changing. Uh, the world of work is changing. Um, there's more and more technology uh, being developed for today's uh, work um, environment to drive processes and improve efficiency even among the workforce, and also to drive efficiency uh, within the work processes. Really. So, what um, we're going to be looking at um, a topic called HSE digitalization, and um, the focus is just going to be on how um, as this help um, to drive health and safety performance um, across the defense sector. So um, as we go into the presentation, we're going to discuss uh, the background history of digitalization. We're also going to look at digitalization um, as a tool for growth and productivity. Thereafter, we'll look at um, how does digitalization meet, what does it really mean for personal health and safety? We'll then look at how is digitalization shaping the global work of lives and worker safety and health um, globally, and how we can also maximize opportunities for health and safety at work. Uh, we'll go through that to look at the benefits of digitalization in an organization, and thereafter we'll be discussing um, other areas of interest. Uh, before now, um, until the end of the 21st century, um, that is when digital, the digital transformation started. If you think back, um, we used to have the, the era of computerization. Um, and then after we looked at um, ERP um, software, um, as the technology advances, we begin to talk about um, electrical discharge machining, which is EDM, and of course the intranet, which uh, most of us are more familiar with. Um, but nowadays, um, today's world, digitalization is taking over globally more than ever before. And it's not just um, a shift from paperwork and uh, that we used to know before. But digitalization um, actually involves the entire process of organization from A to Z. That means it looks at the entire process um, from, from the input to the output of a business uh, in entirety. Um, so the evolution of technology is really driving digital transformation. And like I said, um, we've never seen more growth like this before. You know, since the 20th century, we have a massive explosion in technological advancement and in evolution. And um, businesses around the world are taking advantage of these changes to help improve their um, digital space as well. So, um, like I said, digital transformation is being accelerated with evolution of technology. We are seeing more and more technology coming up. We are seeing how technology is changing the world of work. And um, for any business that you want to compete today, um, you must begin to think about how you can make use of digitalization to drive your internal processes. Otherwise, um, you'll be lacking behind. And for us as a safety practitioner, um, one of the areas that we must drive performance or help to improve safety is to look at the tools for growth and productivity, uh, which is basically um, digitalization. So, like I said, digitalization involves conversion of information from one and format into digital. Um, before now, the focus is on paperwork, how you document your processes, your risk assessment is done using paperwork, 
um, documentation of your processes and procedures are documented using paperwork. But these are gradually changing, and most organizations, responsible organizations, are recognizing the, the, the fact that um, manual format is no longer um, the in thing. So, digitalization entails the increases of building information modeling. It's an entire process, is, uh, okay? It involves information modeling, it incorporates um, remote operation, automation, robots, and artificial intelligence and technology. All of these are integrated. Create what we call digitalization. And of course, um, it also involves the access to cloud based resources um, in order to use and analyze uh, big data as well. So, this digital transformation or digitalization processing company is one of the major investments for most organizations. So, let me ask this question openly to everyone. Um, anyone uh, who can tell us what does digitalization mean to operationalize and safety? Anyone? What does it mean for question and safety? Anyone who can help? What does it mean to you? Okay. No one? Okay, so how is this direction shaping the global working life and worker safety and safety? Okay, I can see it here. Cynthia is up. Or Cynthia, please, could you please unmute yourself? And, All right. Um, what does it mean to me? I hope there is no wrong or right answer to this. Just so for me, digitalization in occupational health and safety makes is for me. I interpret it as making my work easy to implement measures that addresses occupational safety and health. Because if I digitalize an inspection process, risk assessment, and I'm, I'm I'm overseeing different sites, I can communicate easily um, in terms of issues that you need to do some review work. So technology, kind of everything actually makes the work easy. That's the way I see it or what it means to me as you know, occupational safety and health. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Any other contribution? Okay, so um, if you look at the construction industry, and the manufacturing and facility management industry, they are increasingly adopting digitalization of construction and facility management process, processes within this industry. And um, digitalization generally in this sector helps to increase their workflow system, and um, reduces errors, and um, also evidence to increase um, safety at work as well. And um, new technologies have been introduced um, to help them increase and improve their value chain all across um, their, their uh, manufacturing or construction and processes. Okay, so the introduction of new technology, introduction of digitalization, and uh, one of the key benefits uh, of that is that it's helping us to improve our value chain, and it's also helping us indirectly to affect the quality of air safety and environment, which we're going to see as we go deep into the um, presentation. So um, let's talk about uh, robotics. I, I know some of us are um, familiar with robots. Um, before now, um, I know the concept of um, the use of robots is not new. And um, this has really made remarkable evolution throughout um, the industry, especially the manufacturing industry. Um, I remember some years ago when I was um, appointed as a testing manager for BMW um, Oxford plant in Oxford, somewhere in London. And I got to that plant and I was so, so amazed um, because as at that time, almost 70% of what you see of the workforce has been taken over by robots. Uh, it was a car assembly section for uh, assembly cars. Most of the robots were actually installed within the factory, and most of them uh, were designed to do repetitive work. So invariably, you, you actually see very few number of workers within the, within the um, shop floor. So what does that mean? Um, it's also the use of technology, okay, to, for the advancement of um, manufacturing processes. And indirectly, what we are seeing is to reduce the number of workforce, reduce incidents, and some of the complex 
um, processes were being handled by these robotics, like for welding, that are used for welding, um, even for painting as well. So those processes, human are actually removed from those processes so that the robots can actually do the work. But these days, what we are seeing, okay, um, digitization is beyond that. It's not beyond the use of just robots. Um, digitization these days is, offer, is offering more innovative and more um, extended work that um, robots can do. And the advantage of what we see now, what we call um, cobot, is that it allows, it's more flexible. Uh, we are seeing due to digitalization um, and the distribution of artificial intelligence, um, we are seeing more advanced robots that can work more with um, human. That means that um, we are beginning to have more robots that can interface more with human beings. Um, so they, are, they always have highly developed sensors and self-optimization of uh, um, algorithms, which makes it possible for them to work with human. They can interact. They can sense human interaction, and they can work flexibly, unlike robots in the past that uh, they just work on their own. They can't sense um, human interaction. And so um, this situation has helped us to improve that, because within the system, um, we cannot use AI artificial intelligence uh, with big data. And of course, the um, internet, um, and availability of um, mobile devices to integrate those things so that they can work more with, with human and be more flexible. So what that means is that all sectors of our economy and the society, especially for advanced um, countries, are shaping the future of work. And, and that involves increasingly sophisticated robots, which can replace workers in, in customer-facing roles or in high risk um, activities. Um, and the potential of these innovations and digitalization to grow demand and increase productivity is uh, very impressive as well. So uh, without talk about cobalt, you can see um, what an example of the cobalt with interaction with human, um, they can sense, um, they can sense human movements, they can also get some kind of interaction with human and um, improve work um, efficiency as well. So another area that uh, we are beginning to see in terms of digitalization is um, what we call exoskeleton. Okay, so um, exoskeleton is actually a new body-worn um, assistive device. It's known as um, exoskeleton. They are more like um, a wearing device that supports the workers to be able to perform manner handling operations, and uh, this helps them to re um, re reduce the impact of the load on the muscular system. And it also helps to support workers with physical impairment. For the workers who have physical impairment, the exoskeleton um, is a wearable system. They can wear it. It helps them to work better, reduce the um, pressure on the muscular system, and um, also help to reduce musculoskeletal disorder. So these are made available for those in the shop floor and help to uh, increase efficiency as well. So if you look at that combined with um, smart robots, which is robots, these are new technology that is being advanced by uh, digitalization. Okay, so like I said earlier, collaborative and smart robots are, are known as robots. Uh, so it's not just normal robots we know. Um, they are collaborative, uh, they are smart, and they can work smarter than the earlier robots we used to know in the past. And they, they are becoming more familiar. Uh, for those who have visited the um, Amazon, uh, this one of the Amazon receives receive, um, multiples of um, deliverables every day. They need to sort them out, what has to sort them, dispatch to different um, locations. And this is one of the tools that they are beginning to use, both the co-robots, um, the cobots and exoskeleton is, is often used within that shop floor. So for Amazon, they've had about over 100,000 AI augmented robots supporting distribution activities globally. So you can imagine over 100,000. Imagine the number of workers that would have been exposed to musculoskeletal disorder and um, so the cobots are helping them to create efficiency, reduce musculoskeletal injury, and also increase, reduce um, injury to workforce as well. Okay, so um, please confirm me and hear the sound. Let me know. Let's quickly listen to Yes, we can hear you. By guiding you through the steps we're putting on the lift suit. Start by putting on the vest like a backpack. Please, can you hear the sound of the video? 
Yes, loud and clear. When you use the left suit for the first time, it needs to be adjusted to your body size by tightening it on your torso, hips and legs. Be sure to tighten it enough that it does not slip but remains comfortable to wear. You might have to readjust the lift suit fittings a little after you've started using it to achieve optimal fit and comfort. Next, adjust the bands at the side of your hips. This will prevent the cuffs from slipping down your thigh. The elastic elements on your back that store the energy should be located on the back. To adjust the lift suit to your body height, move the adjustment buckles on your lower back. Loose band ends are potentially dangerous as they could get stuck. To avoid this, there are loops installed to safely secure all these bands. Each time before you start working, activate the lift suit by pulling the activation straps on top of your shoulders. This will tension the elastic elements so that they support your back and hips when lifting and leaning. When it is activated, it will support you during every lift. When you momentarily don't need support or are on a break, it is important to deactivate the lift suit to ensure that you can move freely. This can be done by releasing the activation buckle and leaning forward or moving your leg. When you start using the lift suit, your work will feel somewhat different. Therefore, we advise that you take some time to get used to the lift suit. Increase the time of use step by step until you get completely comfortable wearing it all day. A good way to get started is to test the support the lift suit provides you. One way is to activate the suit, lean forward and release the support. You will feel your muscles abruptly stabilizing your upper body. This is the level of support that you can expect from the lift suit. When you are finished working, the lift suit can be removed easily in seconds. Okay. Okay, so um, we can see the importance of um, exoskeleton. So we're also going to be looking at other uh, smart devices uh, that is presently being used um, in the workplace. We also have what we call the smart workwear, um, unlike the coverall that we now um, most employees are used to. Organizations are beginning to use make use of more and more smart workwear, and um, this smart workwear have um, uh, mobile devices integrated into this workwear. Uh, we have what we call wearable, um, which also includes these monitoring technologies. The workwear has um, those monitoring devices integrated into the workwear to allow for those who might want to, to allow for uh, adequate monitoring, uh, whether you're working in confined space or you're working as a just situation. Um, this will also help us to monitor exposure, also to monitor um, where if there's a need for um, emergency situation. Um, the, the use of this uh, monitor, this is used to monitor workers in real time and also aid workers' risk assessment. Um, for, it's very common within the mining sector and for those working in a highly hazardous environment like in deep confined space area, you can wear this smart workwear and um, those um, integrated uh, monitoring devices allows those who are off um, the area where you are working, they can monitor what you are doing in real time, they can monitor the exposure limits and respond when the need uh, revive, um, re arises. And these monitoring devices are linked through communication um, to smartphones as well. You can also integrate um, the information to smartphones so that uh, you can monitor it from your phone. And someone who is working remotely can also monitor where you are, what you are doing, and uh, the exposure limits and um, other information that might be required um, when you use this smart uh, workway. So um, we also have for digitalization, one of the um, advancements of digitalization is we are going to see the use of big data, um, artificial intelligence and algorithm. These are integrated um, for increasing um, information, gathering information, and also uh, monitoring data 
and also driving it and safety within um, organization as well. So as you can see, work is increasingly overseen and coordinated by algorithm artificial intelligence based on big data, tracking data on workers' productivity, location. They can track your location. They can track your vital sign. If there are any stress indicators, this can be tracked from uh, merely looking at your digital devices uh, using data that analyze through um, AI as well. Uh, micro pressure expression can be seen uh, if you are working remotely, um, whether it's your sweat, if, for example, somebody who is already stressed, uh, who has worked longer hours can be monitored. You can see the sweat, so you can look at your pressure expression remotely and decide um, what to do. So those data can be gathered over a period of time and analyzed to determine to help decide on um, control measures to put in place. You can also quickly look at this. So as you can see, as they move around the shop floor, it's easier to determine what an activity um, a worker is doing. If there's any um, non-compliances or deviation, like not wearing PPE, um, the, the guy is working um, at the remote area can actually see all those activities, can sense it and take records of those things at any point in time. So as you go around the shop floor, those data are collected, you know, so we can view remotely. Um, we can also get that data over time. Um, with this information, we can know how many times you've missed where your PPE, how many times you've um, had one or two violations in terms of unsafe act, unsafe practices. Um, this helps us to gather those information for analysis and so that we can create intervention programs. So it also helps us to identify um, areas um, which focus, we need to, which area we need to focus most of our intervention. So we also have the sensor as smart personal protective equipment. I mentioned that earlier. So it has integrated sensors um, or signal integrated into it. I know um, it's most um, advanced organization or international organization uses, especially for um, mining and uh, offshore operations. For mobile monitoring devices, I do think better into your PPE for monitoring of hazard, um, collocation of data, you can also collect data and predict potential host problems that may occur. Uh, like I said earlier, once this information are gathered, they can measure your temperature, you can measure your exposure limit, you can even measure something as simple as your blood pressure. So that over a period of time, we can look at those information and um, make a decision by analyzing. So if you look at this measuring, this particular part, is measuring the chemical and external temperature sensor. This measures the chemicals around and the temperature uh, within where you are working. Okay, the air sensors might be monitoring your BP and other um, air related issues like BP or your, temp your body temperature as well, so that we can see if um, it's going beyond acceptable limit. We also have wireless communication devices that can be used to um, sense or signal information to those working, um, monitoring the operation. We also have chemical and external temperature sensors. This can measure the temperature of the environment and also if there's any chemicals um, that is not um, acceptable or the range or as within outside the exposure limit. We can also monitor that and gather information and use that to make intervention program. Miners work in dynamic and unpredictable conditions. They are exposed to health and safety hazards. Mining companies are constantly working to make this environment safe. What if there is a smart and intelligent way to make the environment in mines safer? Meet Joel and Samuel. They are two miners who work at Smart Mine, a technology advanced mining company. Today, they have been tasked to prepare the mine face for blasting. Let's see how they plan to do this. Joel and Samuel start off by wearing their smart gear, which is integrated with a wearable technology. The jacket has an integrated smart sensor, which monitors their vitals, such as heart rate, blood pressure fatigue level, ECG. It also has the capability to detect dangerous contaminants like carbon monoxide. The helmet comes with a hands-free communication system, which helps Joel and Samuel to communicate with other miners and the mine operations room. 
A smartwatch is handy as it helps them map their route in the mine. With their smart gear, their location gets updated into the system. Joel and Samuel plot the safest route to the site on their smartwatch. They follow the mapped route to the location and arrive at the destination. Joel looks at the proximity location of other miners and machines in the area and alerts them that they are going to detonate the explosives. The explosion happens. Rocks fall and there are some dangerous contaminants in the atmosphere. Joel and Samuel are trapped. They start feeling dizzy. The vital signs, blood pressure, ECG, are in the abnormal range. The smart gear automatically triggers an alert to notify the mining operations room and other miners. The mining operations room notifies the nearest rescue and emergency services. The rescue team is able to locate Joel and Samuel on their smartwatch and maps the safest route to rescue them. The operator at the same time is able to monitor Joel and Samuel's vitals and communicate this with the emergency services. The rescue team arrive and pull off the boulders and gets them out of the mine. The vital signs show some improvement. The paramedics arrive on time. Joel and Samuel are back safe with their families. The wearables kept everyone informed about the health and safety of the miners. What you have just seen is one among the many possibilities of wearable technology in the mining sector. Imagine the possibilities. Deloitte wearables. Okay. Miners work. So, um, the thing is, we have to start thinking beyond um, um, our normal routine risk assessments. Um, this is this is actually telling us that um, those are the days where we just um, do a risk assessment without thinking about how technology can be used to improve um, our work processes and improve safety on our work activity. Something as simple as smartwatches can also play a vital role um, in even making decisions on how we um, improve safety on our work site as well. Let's look at virtual reality and augmented reality as well. Uh, virtual reality is um, beginning is also giving an advantage to um, removal of as a, a workforce from an hazardous environment. And we can see that um, this is becoming very useful, especially for training and also for helping us to um, build competency of our employees uh, without exposing them to um, hazardous environment. Um, these days, a lot of companies are going to use virtual reality to train employees for complex tasks without exposing them to a real work environment. For example, We've seen virtual reality being used for working at sites where employees are trained. They assume that they are in real life work environment. They are assumed to be working at site, and this is used to train them on what they need to do when they are in real life situation without actually putting them in that um, um, hazardous situation during training as well. So, we've also seen several uh, of these being used for fire um, emergency response and training. Where an employee is assumed to be in a fire in um, in a fire situation and is asked to demonstrate what action he will take um, in case he's exposed to that in real life. So the virtual reality and augmented reality offers advantage of removing many workers from hazardous environment as they can be used, for example, to support maintenance tasks and for immersive training as well. Immersive in terms that it assumes as if you are in a real world environment, as if you are in a real work setting. Um, but in reality, you are not. Okay, so augmented reality will also provide contextual information on hidden hazards, so that presence of asbestos and other um, issues that might need to be that you might face in the real work environment. So this is uh, this is also um, helping the world of work as well.
Um, of course, now what we call additive manufacturing, we're almost trending up now. Um, additive manufacturing is also one of the uh, digital transformation we are seeing in the manufacturing industry, where um, um, you use the use of cards to design what you want to produce. And once uh, the card, as once you've done the design, it's taken through a manufacturing process, okay? And um, through digitalization, and those information are sent to um, various devices who then manufacturing the equipment um, using the CAD um, CAM approach to actually produce um, the equipment you've designed. This is used for complex, um, uh, this is used for producing complex equipment or complex um, manufacturing um, devices that you might need, especially for cars and other um, robotic or high level um, complex system as well. What is additive manufacturing? Additive manufacturing, also known as 3D printing, is a process that creates a physical object from a digital design. An engineer designs the object using computer-aided design, or CAD, software. The 3D design file is then sliced into thin layers and uploaded to an additive manufacturing machine. The manufacturing process begins once an extremely thin layer of metal powder is spread across the platform. A heat source, such as laser or electron beam, then melts the first layer of the 3D design. The platform is lowered, and another layer of metal powder is spread across the platform. The layering and melting process is then repeated until the part is complete. The metallic powder is removed, and a physical object is revealed. Additive manufacturing allows you to produce parts that are lighter, stronger, and more durable than traditionally made parts. Build times are faster. Engineers can add precise features and complex geometries without increasing cost. In fact, additive manufacturing is... Re okay, so let's look at mobile de uh, digital devices. Um, this is becoming very popular now. And um, for some of our projects, um, for some of our projects, this is often used to actually monitor activities on some of the sites without actually exposing ourselves to um, the site really. And um, for those of us who um, have, for example, if you're on a project where you have other teams outside uh, the local location, for example, we have a project in Nigeria and you have people um, in UK, abroad, or wherever location they might be, um, you can actually, they can actually be part of the joint inspection by using a mobile digital devices. Uh, you can take them around the site and uh, wherever they are, in, whether they are Zoom, they log in, you have your devices on, and everybody can see what the site looks like while you walk them through the site as well. So um, this is often used for virtual tour, uh, where a team outside uh, your project team that might be in different locations can key in and see real life issues of how the site is being managed as well. So one of the good things, one of the advantages of this is that it, it uh, promotes collaboration you might have much of your more experienced team in other locations. For example, you have a, a project in, in, in Lagos and you sit as the head, um, as the head um, HSC for your company and you have a, a project in Bayesa. You might not really need to be in Bayesa. Um, your on-site HSC team can um, log you in and you join them in a joint talk as they go around the site um, through the mobile devices. You can see how the site moves and also give advice on what they need to do to promote safety on that site as well. So that's one of the things we are seeing. For, for drones as well, it's also one of the digitalization we are seeing for in today's world, where um, we can use drones to see other areas or complex areas that uh, you might not want to expose yourself to. Um, you can see how the drone is used to view the upper part of the building without the guy going at it as well. So this is used for routine inspection and removal of focus from hardware as well. Um, drones can take pictures, can take videos, and which you can then use to review, analyze uh, the information the drones um, are giving you once um, that exercise is completed as well.
So, um, what we're trying to do with the UAVs is, is be able to time. capture that perspective uh, uh, that you can only get so with the UAV that the, the client really needs for the um, on high -rise so this, uh, without a you, um, company with web cameras and now UAVs. To, we um, looked around the market, after all the information, so and then that you can we had drone deployments in areas, and they as can well record, as well. All the standard features that drone deployments have are able to be focused into our specific clients' needs and workflows. So by speeding this up and sharing the information from the, from the job site trailer to the office, we're able to actually uh, join those guys together and, and bridge that gap of communication. I uh, also have the surveillance camera, which is you can install the surveillance camera to get real life information of how the site is is being managed, um, the right the site situation, and um, you can get that information and use that to know um, how people are working, especially for remote or night operations. You can have this camera installed and within your location, even um, without being on site, you can see how the work is being carried out. You can advise if you see any other situation, you can intervene quickly. And offer advice on how you can um, help drive safety on site as well. So we are seeing more and more projects installing surveillance camera to help them know and um, what is happening on site. Um, also, help them to intervene when it requires. And it is also helpful doing incident investigation as well, so that um, you can see what has happened, uh, the root cause, and what you can do to prevent it from happening in future. So um, this more you can do surveillance. Um, also, help employees to comply with established policies and procedures. If they know their surveillance camera, they tend to um, adapt quickly to working safely. Um, can also be useful for incident investigation and help also improve site safety. Okay, so how can we maximize the situation opportunities for safety and health? I think most of them have been answered. Uh, it produces better and more efficient work processes, help us to increase productivity. Um, big data. Okay. Us, help us to analyze data and improve decision making. It, it allows us to remove workers from hazardous situation, just like we've seen in those videos, and um, help us to be innovative and monitor exposure of workers and improve the quality of life as well and improve the quality of work um, by leaving workers on repetitive um, routine, just like we've seen in case of in the case of robots, um, right. removing workers from hazardous situation and helping to improve the quality of um, work as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we can see that football can facilitate access to work for many people by excluding them from um, high for musculoskeletal uh, exposure. So um, permit workers to benefit from higher level of autonomy and flexibility as well. Um, robots can do, they can interact with employees and um, they can help us to take ourselves away from highly hazardous situation as well. So um, we can, we can then uh, facilitate the assets for a more diverse workforce to the labor market. Um, especially volume people can be part of the workforce. Uh, aging workers and those who, with care duties at home can also uh, participate in helping to improve safety of their workforce as well. And disabled people now have devices. We saw the exoskeleton that they can use to improve um, their, their life, uh, work, work life as well. And for the aging workers, uh, work, workforce, as well, there are a lot of devices that can help them to still remain at work and support the workforce as well, so that we are not losing the experience they've built over time as well. Okay, so effective training, we can see what virtual reality is doing to advance training and why also re, uh, improving um, OSHA inspection and workplace inspection. We can also help reduce, um, reduce near misses and accident at work. Um, you can see in the case of drones, you don't need to go up there. Um, you don't need to expose yourself to a situation. The drones can take the pictures, videos that you can analyze. And we also see the use of integrated uh, monitoring system in um, devices, um, work where that um, those who work in remote areas can help to monitor their vitals and um, allow us to respond quickly in case of emergency. Um, we're also improving stakeholders and better corporate responsibility. Of course, when there are lower incidents, it improves the corporate image of the organization and improves collaboration with the community where we operate. In conclusion, uh, the conclusion is that we must learn to adopt innovative technologies and solutions in today's health and safety, um, in addressing today's health and safety challenges. 
uh, we must drive efficiency by thinking about innovative technologies. We must begin to include that in our HSC plan. We must begin to include that in our strategy um, on how we manage death and safety. And uh, we must begin to think about advancement. And uh, the risks are changing uh, in modern day work. Uh, new risks, more new technologies are coming up and more new risks are being introduced. And we must take use of the um, technology to help us um, advance um, the reduction of injury and ill health in the workplace. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, sir. I uh, really appreciate our speaker for today. You agree with me that he has done justice to this topic. And um, honestly, I've written so much. My work is very good. Uh, quite a number of them. Um, a number of thoughtful and innovative points to look at um, what um, digital technology or digital um, generation can do for us in this uh, HSC space. Uh, a number of things we talked about. We yes, um, look at how we can shape our workplace and our lives in terms of adopting the innovative and technology solution that digitalization will offer us. A list of some of the benefits to an organization. And of course, I know that I have lots lot of questions for our amiable speaker today. Uh, please, if you have questions, you can drop them in the chat or indicate by a raise of hand. We have just seven minutes to look at um, the question. Uh, thank you very much. A lot of comments in the chat box. I mean, in the in the chat box for our speaker. Thanks a lot. Good presentation. Keep it up. Brilliant presentation. Well done. Okay. And a very apt and enlightening. Thank you so much, sir. So we'll start with question. I can see someone uh, raising up. Cynthia, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question, please? All right. Brilliant presentation, Engineer K. Um, so my question would be on applic applicability. Whilst you, your presentation has made us, at least for me, I've learned way beyond a lot of ap applicability of digitalization in HSC. Um, what will be your thoughts for some of us that kind of manage uh, organizations where there are existing plans already? If we make or reflect on the smart mind that you made presentation on, I want to believe that um, those things we are thought out from probably from the beginning design and planning that helped them to be able to apply all of those things. What are, are the things you could advise from your wealth of experience or, or thoughts on the applicability of this in cases or in Nigeria right now where we kind of manage some plans that have been in existence for quite a long time. Um, just for example, if we are overseeing a mine, a mine activity that keys into one of our processes that doesn't really have this, um, and there is a possible exposure to silica dust and stuff like that, how do we even begin to have this conversation? Um, the practical way of how do we begin to have this conversation with the decision makers? Okay, thank you, Cynthia. If you look at, um, to be honest, so, some of these are already being introduced, like for, for us that um, um, support some companies in Nigeria. Um, surprisingly, you realize that um, most times when we sit with our clients, one of the advice we normally give to them when they ask us to draw up the strategy for the project, um, what we try to do is to see where we can take advantage of these technologies and introduce. Um, for example, if you look at um, the use of um, digital devices, for example, those are simple. They are, they are easy. Most of us have devices on our phones. Most of us have our tab tablets. And these are these are readily available. And they are, they are not quite very expensive. Um, if You might be surprised that most of these things are not quite expensive, really. So I'll give two examples. Uh, one of them is device, um, mobile devices. 
and mobile devices in your team, let's assume in your manufacturing plants, uh, whatever they may be. Maybe you sit in Lagos, maybe you have a plant in Kano, and you have the HSC, you have your HSC rep for that particular shop floor. Um, have you included, um, for example, have you included virtual tour? Virtual tour, all you do, what do you need in the virtual tour? It's just your Zoom meeting link and a device that the person can log on with. And what is that device? Your phone, for example, and the internet. Once the internet is available, the phone is available, the person logs in, then it takes you around the site. Other members of your team logs in there and they go around the site and everybody can see the right, right uh, the way the site is and offers immediate on the spot um, suggestion or what needs to be seen. We say this on so we can ask, so why is it like this? Why is this place like this? Or then you then give recommendation, real time recommendation. Those are simple, they are not expensive. The other thing you raised about um, how do we begin? I think we just have to start with, with um, the next budget. Um, by the time we are going for the next budget, put these things inside. The guys, some are, you might be surprised that some are already existing. For most manufacturing plants, they will most likely have the cameras in. But what you see is that, are we using those cameras for our own advantage? Um, sometimes we find out that the cameras are used by the security team just to monitor text. Did they take anything out of the factory or not? No, that's not what we should be saying. And we should be taking those security team and also increasing their knowledge of HSC awareness, putting them in training, letting them know what is unsafe, fast, unsafe condition, building that knowledge of awareness of health and safety. So that when they sit there, they are not just looking at tech, they are also analyzing, looking at the video cameras and saying, okay, what has gone wrong? What can go wrong? Or what has gone wrong? What, oh, is this, 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 this act is unsafe? What do we then do to, to prevent it? They can also be a source of information and solution driven for the organization as well. Then um, lastly, I think um, in terms of resources, if you look at, I think you mentioned uh, maybe um, exposure to silly card box. Most times, uh, most organizations will always have the monitoring equipment. So don't let us be too quick, quick to look at monitoring equipment. Let's even look at what is the cost of getting integrated workwear with monitoring equipment without just buying the monitoring equipment alone. The differences are not too much. All you just need to do is just, um, if you look at the, the, the budget. So I would rather say that let's start with the right budget. Go into a presentation with management in your next project to say, let's begin to move from what we are doing. And these are opportunities for improvement. Let's look at how much is this going to cost us? And how much are we really going to be saving um, in the next week? What, how much are we really going to be saving if we implement this? So we need to move from just listing monitoring equipment, but saying no, we can we can reduce costs by getting one a workwear uh, that will not require high vest anymore. So the cost of buying a high vest has been removed. But at the same time, we're also integrating um, monitoring system. But what I can tell you is that they are not too expensive. I don't know if I'm going to answer your question, really, but that's what I will say. So my approach will be in simple terms: is let's begin to look at the cheaper ones first. Like let's start with the cheaper ones. Like the virtual tour, if you introduce a virtual tour where people can see, uh, if I won't tell the management to be part of it, maybe one um, one month, uh, every month um, leadership tour, and it's virtual. When they begin to see the benefit of those virtual tour, by the time you are recommending all these other ones, they will most likely buy into it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I think in addition, um, during the the COVID-19 lockdown, we had to adopt um, the use of digital, mobile digital devices for, for our site audience. As a matter of fact, some group of us we were meant to come in from Switzerland, but because of the lockdown, they felt we can't postpone this audience. Let's leverage on technology. So we had to look at using the mobile digital device I mean, and it was we were able to get real time feedback. We have guys position with their phone, with their camera phone everywhere, and then we're able to connect remotely to also find out what was going on at the shop, shop plus. So thank you very much, Engineer Arcade. Okay, we'll start from what is within uh, our circle of control, which is a mobile device or mobile digital devices. So there's a question here from someone, and the question is from the uh, Akanimo. Is asking, depending on the type of activities to be performed, can the exoskeleton devices be used together with the safety body analysis? So that, that's another question for this. Okay. 
Okay, yes, yes, it can, but um, what we we'll normally say is that you need to look at the take do a fitness test. Okay, the fitness test is to see how does it integrate into um, the use of harness as well. Um, so if you have to use the harness, then uh, there has to be a test to check that uh, it's not going to um, impose any um, unnecessary additional risks to the person um, using it. So the answer is yes, you can, but uh, you need to assess the situation and make a decision. And sometimes you just need to do a trade-off. Um, where the tax, do we actually need to use annex where we need to work? If the answer is yes. The other question, does it involve panel handling? If the answer is also yes. Remember, um, in the hierarchy of control for manner handling, you have to think about using other means before you talk about um, PPE, really. So um, if there are other methods that can be used to carry out the tax, why not? Um, you can use other devices, equipment to help you support the lifting and use uh, um, for carrying out that manner handling tax. But where it is not reasonably practicable, then um, the exoskeleton will come useful as well. But the answer is yes, you can. But you need to do an assessment to be sure that you are not imposing any risks. And where there is a risk being imposed, then you are advised to look at other means of carrying out the tax without using exoskeleton. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Uh, another question. Uh, someone is asking me here, is there any software dedicated to EHS management and tracking? Yeah, I think any So the person is asking, is there any software dedicated to environment health and safety management and tracking? Are there any form of software that can be used for tracking, like the tracking? Okay, yes, there are a lot of software there are a lot of software out there. Um, uh, I, I don't want to commercialize any, um, promote any product yet, uh, because they've not paid me to do that. But really, there are a lot of software out there that you can you can use. If you go, if you put on Google and just type um, health and safety software, someone is already Niosh. Niosh is a popular one. I think um, somebody has dropped me off. I think that thing should be L E O S H. I guess um, I think that should be this not E H S. Uh, yes, I think that should be the right spelling. So the arch is is often used. There are also other uh, data gathering software, and some are actually used for compiling um, reports as well. Um, for analyzing your reports, your report goes in and is sent to every member within the organization as well. That's for reporting. There's other one for gathering data as well. And there's other software for monitoring. So uh, if you go on Google and just type um, um, different devices, then you can you can always have uh, access to them. But I know um, I've seen that of Niosh. And uh, for this for reporting, um, clients have different different software and different apps for also gathering data. And um, depending on the company you work for, um, you we have different different. Different ones available in the market, really. So the answer is yes. Thank you very much, sir. Another question here from uh, Akinemi uh, is asking In what ways can drones be utilized for safety inspections and emergency response in hazardous environments? That's the first question. Then, it's coming in, please. Okay, maybe. Now, so it's asking in what ways can drones be utilized for safety inspections and emergency response in hazardous environment? Okay. The so use for, of drones for yeah, so for drones, for example, you can do drones for firefighting. Okay, um, for firefighting, a lot of countries, um, developed countries, most of them are going to see drones being used for fire, essentially for high-rise buildings where the drone takes um takes off from the ground level to upper floor, and um, they're able to discharge um, um, firefighting um, devices to, to counter the spread of that fire. So yeah, drones is used for firefighting. Um, drones can also be used for, in terms of inspection, um, the drone can record. One of the um, good tools that you get from drones is that you can go back, you can do a playback, um, it can take pictures, it can record, and when it can give you real-time um, uh, information about what is happening. And sometimes, even at ground level, as the drone is up, you can see those information on your on your on your tablet, on your tablet as uh, and see those information. 
even though you are at ground level, you can see what's happening at, at up level. So even at that ground level, you can begin to do your analysis real time. You can even stop your work immediately. If the drone picks up an activity and it's highly um, risky, what you can do is you can even stop the work immediately and send communication up there that that job should be stopped. That's one of the advantages. And another advantage of drones is that you can go back and do a replay because it can also um, record, depending on the type of drones, there are different capacity on what they can do. There are drones that can only take pictures, uh, but there are some that can video as well. So you can take the video and play back and even see things you didn't see at that, at that particular time. So that's one of the advantage of drones. So um, it allows you as an individual collectively to look at those information and analyze as well. And, and also for incident investigation, if an incident has occurred, you can go back to what you the, your last inspection, look at the real life situation of how the site is. Somebody can see sitting in, in panel and get real life information from drones or what is happening on your site in Lagos. So those are helpful for incident investigation as well. As, um, as well. Then like I said, for firefighting, for in terms of emergency, drones can also be helpful because it gives you information to even, before the fire rescue even goes up, they can see what is happening up there. They can see the spread of fire. They can see where areas have been affected and which areas that um, they need to respond to. So um, those are the advantages and how they can use for inspection and um, for, um, for emergency as well. Thank you very much. Also from the same person, it's asking what are the challenges associated with implementing technology-driven health and safety practices in the workplace? Challenging associated with implementing technology-driven health and safety practices in the workplace. Okay, so, so we can see that um, um, technology can fail. Okay, um, okay. that's another thing we should all know. And um, sometimes you also it also relies on the human interference for it to succeed as well. Um, if you have a drone and you don't have the competency to operate the drone, the drone itself cannot function. So you need it, human interference for it to be able to deliver the work you want to do. You can give two people the, uh, the same drones and they will give you the different results. So the competency of the person using the technology is also very important. And um, we also know that technology can cannot function on its own. Um, we also need support from human as well. For example, you might be doing your virtual tour and um, uh, data, and um, the, your, your, you run out of data. What's going to happen? You've lost the opportunity because you are not on site. You cannot carry it out as well at that moment. So we've also seen inspection being done by virtual tour, and it has to be canceled, either because the internet is bad, uh, people on the call who had already left what they are doing to attend the tour cannot continue as well. So, um, so those are some of the disadvantages of, um, um, and sometimes it introduces the risks as well. As you are using oh. your tablet on the shop floor, you are also distracted because you also want to maintain focus. And that might you are also be introducing new risks as well. So those are some of the disadvantages of um, um, some of the risks um, it also poses. And sometimes uh, we end up relying too much on technology for, for managing health and safety as well. So, and sometimes complacency, uh, the, 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 the analysis is done um, by the software and it's given to you. But um, sometimes it also requires human knowledge to be able to interpret some of those information and, and use it um, to the business benefit as well. So, um, yeah, so those are some of the um, limitations of using technology. Yeah, thank you very much. Now, another question here from Adi Jumoke. For mobile devices and surveillance cameras, are there specific devices in this context? So, come again, please. Let's see the camera, etc. So, the person is trying to find out if for mobile devices and surveillance camera, if there are specific devices in this context, as in inbuilt devices, or yes. the idea yes, is so to adopt irregular devices, e.g., the tablet and the system. Uh, okay, so so you can you can use both actually. There are specific devices, there are also um, um, devices. In fact, so like that's why I said some of these things are, can be very very simple as well. 
um, some of the existing devices you can use, you have cameras on your phone, um, you can use that as well. Um, doing especially for virtual tour, you can use that to get information. Um, some some um, recently we have to get uh, what they call the you see the ladies use it more and uh, what's this stick um, for is is run off my head now. You know, so most people use it just to take time to take selfie, but then it's also take selfie. But for us, we use it during our virtual tour because the person can take it, so the hand is not interfering on the surface of the camera. So you just use it and um, use it to move it around so that everybody can see um, the site clearly. So generally, um, but most times, they always advise the 4K cameras. The 4K cameras are, are clear, they are HD. You can see it, you can see the picture clearly as well. So we always advise that. Um, otherwise, um, on low budgets, um, just like the answer question Cynthia asked at that time, we can get, we can start from lower budget devices then as we advance, we increase to 4K cameras and other um, advanced cameras. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, two or three more questions. How can we embrace digitalization without compromising OHS, especially in the oil and gas environment? How can we embrace digitalization without compromising the OHS, especially in the oil and gas environment. Hello, Angela K. This one, family can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you now. Please come again. Okay, so the person is asking how we can embrace digitalization without compromising. OSH, especially in the oil and gas environment. Okay, so so for the oil and gas um, environment, I know um, um, the um, some of the other aspects, you know, maybe cameras. You can't use cam certain cameras in um, some areas, but we saw how lots what we call intrinsic cameras as well that you can still use in um, uh, in oil and gas um, environment as well. So in fact, those intrinsic cameras are also acts of digitalization as well. Okay, so it's not going back to the other question, the person asked, what kind of devices can you use? Can you use? That even takes me back to say it's not all devices that you can use in this in all environment. You also need to look mm -hmm. at are they are text rated? Um, are those cameras are they available? Are they are text rated? Are they uh, um, are those cameras um, suitable for for uh, such kind of environment so that you don't have um, unnecessary uh, fire explosion and the rest. So in terms of digitalization, those things are also considered in the design of um, some of these devices as well. There are devices that are, that are spark proof. There are devices that are that you can use in oil and gas environment as well. So what you just need to do, that's why it's very important to also educate your procurement team so that when they are procuring items, um, safety consideration is also integrated into those decisions as well. Uh, if you are procuring PPE, we saw how the PPE, um, those measuring um, instruments are integrated into the PPE you are, you are procuring. But if you are procuring a sensory instrument, what exactly do you want to measure? Okay, so those are some of the things you also need to ask. Is it hydrogen sulfide? Are you um, 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 trying to measure the level of oxygen or carbon dioxide in the air, or are you measuring? So whatever you are measuring, you also need to consider all that and educate your your procurement team on what they should be preparing. So digitalization is good, but it's also very important that people who are getting those tools are also well informed about the specification and the utilization of those devices for the right environment. So it's just about educating your, your procurement team on what to get. But in terms of whether they are available and can be used safely, safety starts by informing your procurement team first about digitalization and the type of devices that is required for the environment they operate. Thank you. Thank you very much. The last question is about data analytics and AI. How can we leverage, how can data analytics and AI be leveraged to predict and prevent workplace accidents. 
how can we leverage on data analytics and AI to predict and prevent workplace accidents? That's the last question. Okay, I, I, I can see that I'm not sparing me any easy question. Actually, this is uh, that's the essence of this presentation. But also see how we can leverage on uh, big data and, uh, of course, artificial intelligence, um, 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 cloud information, and of course, internet and other um, um, IT related software to to help us prevent accidents. I think all what we've discussed all through are vital in helping us to prevent workplace accidents. If you look at some of the videos we shared earlier, um, if I go back a bit, uh, we did see how even on the shop floor, where the guys can what is additive move around, you know, is helping you to dictate what can go wrong. I, I'm not sure if it's this. Uh, let me see. Okay, so you can see on the, uh, I don't know if it's my screen is still on, but you can see the devices. Okay, um, what you have there is that there are two things. There are two things that can happen here. You can have a standalone sensor within the within the shop floor that is picking everybody of what they do and is sensing information to tell you what they are doing at the right at that time, what kind of unsafe fact and unsafe condition that they can repeat that can be in addition to that particular individual as well. So those information is gathered. So if I pick, for example, the man here, if I pick that for that day, he has, he has bent 10 times. He had 10 awkward positions. That means that what might happen over a period of time, he might begin to have back pain. So we might take that person off the shop floor and educate him more about um, uh, musculoskeletal disorder. The information can also, the, uh, the, the AI can also help you to analyze how many people within the city? Is it 70%? Is it 60%? What is the most common or safe act among these people? Is it that at certain point time of the day, they don't wear PPE? If that's the case, then we can take that information and use that to develop um, intervention as well. Of course, that helps to prevent accidents because what you are trying to do is to be proactive, to say, okay, what are the things that we've noticed on the shop floor that can result to an accident? And if we gather those information, we can then analyze that data and say, okay, 30% of the workforce on a daily basis, okay, um, use the machine, um, use the unguided machine, or 60% of our workforce tends to remove the guard on that machine before it's used. The, 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 you can predict, you can get those information, and that can then help you to quickly drop intervention, train them, and even when there's an incident, that can also pick it out and help you to analyze those incidents. So, um, for the AI, it's more about prevention rather than being reactive. So it's a very good tool to help you to um, analyze um, or safer and make decisions about the interventions you might need to put up within your system and help you to also improve your processes and procedures. Because from those learning, you help to strengthen your procedure as well and reduce any further gaps. Um, I hope that's, that's clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have done justice to all the questions. Uh, let me hand over back to the chairman for the certificate presentation. Over to you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sorry, quickly, before the chairman, for those requesting for the recorded version, please get back to your regional lead or secretary who will ensure that we share this information through the the WhatsApp group of the various regions. Thank you. Mr. Charles. Thank you once again, uh, Engineer Kyle Um I just want to be sure I'm able to share my screen so that I can share the certificates from my end here. Thank you for a wonderful and insightful sharing today. I'm sure like a couple of messages we've had and even feedbacks uh, where people said this is mind engaging and it's also going to challenge us. Uh, Engineer Kaudi, can you please stop sharing so that I'm able to share the certificate and I'm also able to share my screen. Okay, thank you. Oh, I think my network tripped. 
uh Gabriel, can you make me a co-host? However, let me just uh speak on the certificate from here. It will be shared with you much later so that we just don't waste so much of time. So uh a certificate is presented to uh engineer Kyode Valentine Fowode, uh being awarded from the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health for the facilitation of our Southwest District 30th March 2024 network meeting uh, on HSC digitalization. Hello, Chairman. Are you able to share from your end? Okay, so I think Chairman is having an issue with his um, network. So, um, so I, I'll take over the um, <clears throat> this aspect. Okay, so the okay. certificate of appreciation has been awarded to Kyode V. Fowode from the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health for the facilitation of our Southwest District uh, 30th March 2024 network meeting on HSC digitalization. Uh, this certificate has been signed by the Chief Executive of IOSH, Vanessa Erwood Witcher. Our engineer Kyode, we will share the certificate with you after this uh, program. Thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation to to uh, present today. Okay, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure of joining us all today. Um, uh, this is my alma mater, so I'm highly delighted to be presented to my professional colleagues and my leaders present. Thank you all. Okay, thank you thank very you. much, sir. Okay, so I will hand over to the central school for updates. I don't know if Gabriel is on the call or the vice chair. Whoever will take us through the office. We have the floor. Please. Okay. Uh, thank you all. And um, okay, please confirm if you can hear me, please. Please take it up. Okay. 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 Uh, Thank you, and I mean, and definitely, I mean, we want to appreciate our, our speaker in the person of Engineer Coyote. I mean, I don't think we should even be appreciating you, because I mean, you, I mean, you are the pioneer, pioneer chair of this, I mean, of this Irish West African branch. But definitely, we have to keep appreciating you for the ongoing support that you are giving us. I mean, I mean, uh, and definitely for this. Uh, wonderful presentation of today. Thanks you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Kay. We sincerely appreciate you. Thank you. And also, I, uh, we have some updates from the central. Number one update is the, I mean, is the, is the, is the newly um, um, co-opted committee members for the branch, for the uh, north central, for Ghana, and for the southwest district. So, I mean, we um, um, we have some new co-opted members. I mean, um, uh, which I wish I released their their names and their details to us last week. And um, on the central, that is the Irish West African branch. I mean, um, 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 uh, we have eleven new committee co-opted members. We are welcoming those eleven, and definitely we know that. I mean, we all we definitely do do the you know, of the Irish West African branch to the next level. So we are welcoming you. And also from the Ghana district, we also have two new co-opted committee members. And from Southwest, definitely 
I mean, um, um, uh, the host of today's meetings, we have the, I mean, uh, we have five newly co-opted committee uh, members, and from the North Central too, we have two. So we are welcoming every of our co-opted committee members on board. Uh, our, you know, our, 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 our network development manager from Ayosh is presently on leave, but definitely she will resume next week. So when she re uh, resumes, a, I mean, a proper orientation will be done. So definitely the date of that orientation will be communicated to, to every new co-opted members. Once again, we welcome you all. Also, I mean, the, um, the, the branch annual general meeting will definitely come up on May 11th. That is the second Saturday in the month of May. That, that is when we have proposed our, I mean, uh, our branch annual general meeting. This is not a mandatory meeting, but definitely it is a meeting that is very, very necessary. It's, I mean, it's for us to definitely give a feedback and definitely see how we can improve in, I mean, in our performance for the coming uh, year. So please let us make it a date on the 11th of May. That is the second Saturday in the month of May. That is the, that is the proposed uh, date for the branch annual general uh, meeting. Uh, I think that is just the update of information from the central. I, um, I will call on the uh, vice chair, if she has any update for us in the person of Oluwa Kemi. Please, Oluwa Kemi, I know that you're on the call. I, uh, if there's any update, Candy or Mutan speak. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we'd like to encourage um, those on this call that uh, wish to move their membership to IOSH West Africa to do that by sending an email to IOSH, CSC at IOSH.com. And also for those that want to renew their membership um, or be a member of IOSH, because I'm sure we have members, we have people on this call that, in, that are intending members. So um, right currently, IOSH is still um, giving the IOSH West Africa um, branch that concessionary um, opportunity. So that's still on. So um, you can just um, go on the IOSH website, you see the um, concessionary form, you also see membership form. And again, if you're also struggling to, to pay with your card, um, is it that you give a call um, to IOSH um, about their phone number, their customer service number is on the website. So um, you can do that all. You can always reach out to any one of us. You can contact us on LinkedIn, on our, um, on our um, platform on LinkedIn, the IOSH West Africa um, page, and we'll be able to um, answer your queries or even send send us an email. Gabriel, please can you drop our email address so that anyone that has queries or you have further comments and all, you can always just send us an email and we will be able to... Um, answer you so yeah. that that concession is still on so um i can't give you the amounts that ayosh is going to um, give you at the moment but you can always do an email so based on on what's um on the requirements you meet on the concessionary form they will let you know the amount to pay so they can decide to give you 50 percent um of course if you maybe don't have a job they can decide to give you free membership so it depends on what you take and um, for every further information concerning the branch, you can always drop us an email and we'll be able to answer you. So um, for now, that's all from us. Thank you. Thank you, Kemi. We're now in the EOB section. I'll be handling the EOB session. We have a question for my king, Mustafa, that was dropped after. Mr. K, are you, Engineer K, are you still there? Engineer K, are you still there? Engineer K, are you still there? He has that.
Can you all hear me? Okay, in that case, don't you there again? Okay, maybe someone else can. Okay, he's not there again. He's not there again. Okay, I came ask that. Do you think that this technology will replace OHS professionals? What can OHS professionals do to keep their jobs? I would love him to answer the question. I think he has left. I think he has left. Um, hello, you today. Okay. Akim, just... Akim is okay. here. Um, if if you like, okay, if yeah, you yeah. want me okay. to just speak a bit. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you for the opportunity. So um, I asked the question, though I have an idea, but I just wanted to um, hear his thoughts and hear the thoughts of other professionals and also to um, pick our brains and get us prepared for the future. Um, what Engineer K shared with us today is the future of the OHS profession. Um, and that's how so many companies will begin to go in the nearest future. So uh, we should begin to think forward. We should begin to think proactive. If you can, I know we are going after uh, NEBOS certification, going after our um, IOS um, certification, IRCS certifications, but also begin to think about artificial intelligence. Also to begin to think about courses around machine, um, machine language, you know, courses around um, how tech can help, how to write languages, Python, you know, all those, you know, um, tech, um, new tech uh, changes um, in the world. We need to also catch up. We, we should not be dinosaurs, you know, in, in, our, in, our, own, uh, in our own enclave thinking that we, we have secured our health and safety professions. Um, let's think how tech would impact on our profession and let's begin to make plans and begin to save some budget towards the trainings. I personally have started learning um, how, to, how to code. I've personally started reading books on artificial intelligence. I personally use um, ChatGPT a lot. So these are opportunities already available for us. You know, let's start taking those opportunities and let's prepare for the future challenges. That's just what I just wanted to share. Tech will not replace us. Uh, tech will still need us, uh, but we also need to be um, trainable. We also need to be prepared uh, to be able to fill those positions that tech would kick um, kick asses away. I'm sorry to use that word. Uh, yeah, so that's, um, that's my comment. Uh, thank you, everybody. All right, thank you, Akim, for that comment. Any other here will be please, if you have any other comment or feedback for us, please raise your hand so I can speak. Okay, since there's no other he will be, are you please? Okay, there's a will be somewhere. Okay, ah, we have a will be. Okay, somewhere Udo, please unmute and speak. Basi, sorry. Samuel, can you hear Good me? You can speak. Yes, I can hear you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the question raised by Mr. Akin, um, when I saw it, I was really, really intrigued. And um, I'm so happy that um, he had um, come to um, open up um, that conversation as to how health and safety professionals uh, can get on, on the wave of AI and technology robotics. And um, going by what uh, Mr. Odi uh, presented to us, it is a wake-up call for all health and safety professionals to get on that, um, we would call it a band bandwagon now, um, but uh, trust me, this bandwagon is a necessary bandwagon that we all need to jump on. And what I really want to speak on at the moment is uh, specific to how health and safety professionals can go to their senior management and tell them, how they as professionals can um, contribute to ensuring that the workplace is um, digitalized. Um, gone are the days where we need to keep all our safety files in one big drawer and take up space in the work um, in, in the workplace. Um, now we have um, solutions where all of health and safety reporting can be done, um, can be reported via mobile phones and then be stored in a cloud. Um, in, a, in a cloud um, uh, um, infrastructure uh, that is almost free um, for everyone uh, to use. Uh, so when we go into the senior management, it is not um, good for us to start um, saying that uh, we need to call on 
uh, or we need to buy a software, or we need to call on some experts to come and install uh, certain sensors in the workplaces for us. It should be uh, now a call uh, for health and safety professionals to provide those solutions themselves to, the, to, 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 to their management, and then you become more relevant as opposed to, you know, go in the, in the, in the, back in the days, um, senior management teams usually have secretaries. For every senior management position, you have a secretary. Or even mid-management, mid uh, mid-managers usually have secretaries in those days uh, to help them do typing, to help them send emails, to help them do all of those things. And in this um, present age, we realize that all of those are gone. Every, any, every, every manager would need to have those kind of digital skills. In, in short, the entry-level person into the workspace is required to have um, basic um, computer knowledge of, uh, of um, you know, presentation and all of those things. So it will become a, um, a necessary um, skill set for every safety professionals to be able to deploy um, solutions, uh, cloud cloud solution to introduce robotics um, that can help to measure uh, certain health and safety indices in the workplace that can be you know um, collected and um, viewed by senior management on a simple dashboard. Uh, so those are necessary skills that we need to have uh, just to also add um, these. Um, in the presentation by Mr. Fowo, they mentioned that especially in a mine, for example, where and wearables need to be deployed. Um, what we need to start to think now is we don't need to go to senior management and say, um, sir, we need all workers, about 100 and maybe 100 workers in the mine. You ask every one of them to wear wearables. Um, that might become a very, very expensive um, endeavor for the senior management to, to sign up on. So what we need to do is to put on our thinking cap and say, if in a cluster, of 10 um, groups in, in each of those um, areas of their work, at least one person should have a wearable device on, and that wearable device on that individual can help to sense either temperature, either um, um, as it is, um, gas uh, uh, emitting from, from that work location, and then that information can then be used to advise those group of workers. We don't necessarily need every worker to wear them, at least in the, in the inception stage where we want uh, this kind of um, uh, digital innovations to be introduced into the workplace. Let us start by saying, you know, in the group, in the cluster of 10 persons, one person can have those variables on, and then the information, the readings from that person can be used to ensure that every other person walking around that vicinity are, are safe. So these are, uh, initiatives and um, ideas that um, safety professionals can, can have or skill sets that they can have to ensure that. Uh, thank you, Sammy, to... for that. Yeah, All right. Thank you very much, Sammy, for that comment. Mr. Julius, can you homot and speak, please? Mr. Good Julius, afternoon, you... professional colleagues. Can you hear me, please? Can I hear you? Okay. Good afternoon, professional colleagues. I just wanted to add, um, first of all, thank you. I came for that very, very, very important question. I think that question should be the, the basis, it should be what should be in our mind when we listen to presentations like this. So let me not repeat the presentation. Let me just go straight and say that um, to bridge the gap between where this presentation is taking us and where we currently are, like for those people who still use papers, to report hazards in their workplaces, who still use papers, to print papers to do their accident investigation reports, and some reports, everything is still in a file and paper, file and paper, file and paper. Maybe the first thing to do is to take one step and say from Tuesday next week, we'll depaper the environment. So get a simple software to start reporting um, UAUCs and hazards within the company, maybe just print the, a code and put somewhere where somebody can scan the code and report incidents. If Even if that's the first step, let us just start somewhere. And you can't start this without some of us, we ourselves acquiring some information about how to you know, set up that form, what data should be in the form, what should we be asking for, how do we advocate for it and all of that? So from the very basic level where some of us still are, 
we need to allow this presentation to inspire us to start the first step to digitization so that it's not like jumping from the ground to the top of the tree. Let us, those who have not started, should try and start with the first step, the paper, the environment. So that like Engineer Jeremy always says, sustainability we would have combined reduction of papers, which is a sustainable um, lifestyle, together with this digitization now to move ourselves to a smart, to gradually begin to move to a smart work environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Julius. We appreciate that. Mr. Ubon, can you please unmute and speak? Mr. Ubon, can you hear me? We can't hear you. OK. Mr. Ubon, can you hear me? OK, let's move to Timmy Tope. Can you speak? President. OK. Yeah. Right. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, Please, thank Samir. You very much, uh, thank you, okay. Colleague. Let okay. me allow Ubo. Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, yeah, can you hear me now? Can I hear you, sir? No, sir. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Can I speak now? I can hear you. You can speak now. Yeah, we can hear you. You can speak now. Can you hear me? Okay, we have to come back to you, please. Mr. Timitope, please, can you move ahead? I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah. You can speak now. You can speak now. You raise your hand. I, can you speak? Sir? I want to say that I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, okay. So I want to appreciate uh, all the speakers. Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, continue, sir. Continue, sir. Can you continue, sir? Yeah, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. I can continue. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We can continue. Okay, we have to okay. move to you because uh, of time. One of the things, one question I want to ask, or I want to appeal. Yes, I want to appeal to as many of us who are able, who are currently making use of digitalization. Yes, I want to appeal for as many of us who are currently, yes, that's what I'm saying. Can you pay you this thing? Say, ask. Uh, your line is breaking. Can you just drop your comments in the chat box? As many of us who are currently making use of the digital You can hear me, please drop your comment in the chat box because of the time, please. Can you hear me? Just drop your comment in the chat box. Um, Mr. Timitoko, please speak. Okay. Uh, thank you. Just to update us, I mean, we'll be having two, I mean, uh, two district meetings in the month of April. We have the Ghana district hosting us on the 14th of April. Please kindly let's take note of this. The, I mean, I mean, the flyer of that meeting will be released very, very soon. Also, I mean, we, we, we also have the North, North Central hosting us on the 21st of April. So, so, so definitely in the month of April, we'll be having two meetings. One is to be hosted by the Ghana district on the 14th of April. And the second one is to be hosted by the North Central district on the 21st of April. If there will be any change to, to this date, it will be communicated to us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. President, for that. Kemi, please unmute and speak now. Kemi, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, I can. Okay, so I want to react to um, Blessing Odor's message that she posted. Uh, Blessing, you said you are struggling with your, that you sent an email to Ayush concerning your membership. Um, at the moment, because of this whole new changes, so there are a lot of mails um, coming into IOSH email. So just be patient. They'll respond to you. But um, if they don't respond to you in the coming week, maybe between now and Friday next week, just drop us an email and the um, chair will take you up with our manager. So just drop your full your full name so that and uh, your email address so that they can um check that. So for those that maybe your you're trying to pay your card can't even go, you can always contact um um 
Mr. Dapo or any other person that has like an international card get so they can help you with that payment. But please note that it's not based on bank bank rates, but on black market rates, so that um we are all on the same page. All right. Thank you. That's all from me. Thanks, it. All right, thank you, Kemi. Mr. Shinen Shineme. Sorry if I don't pronounce the name, I'm sorry. Shineme Okafor, please turn on mutan now and speak. Mr. Shineme Okafor. Hello, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me, please? Good afternoon. I can hear you. All right. Yeah. I want to um thank the organizers of this um meeting. Uh, it's been very, very um educative and um, informative. I also want to share my thoughts in addition to this and also to encourage those that are yet to go digital as far as um, health and safety is concerned to do same. So uh, I just newly joined a new company. Before I joined um, where I was, we do our, we call it BBSWA, we call it behavioral based safety workarounds. And an app was developed and that's what we use. It's a multinational company. So everybody, reports um, observations on that platform. And it's been very, very good. It helps us to monitor the trend, gives us real-time information, and saves us um, having lots of paper. And then when I joined this new company, I saw much more improvement. We have an e-sheet tagging platform to raise um, tags for things that need repair. You assign it to the responsible persons online. And it becomes it, it comes to them as an email notification on their emails, and then they take actions. We have things like um, uh, what's it called? Right now, we just launched our, our e permits to work. So your permit to work, your risk prediction, everything is online. You just go. You have people that you have authorized and given access as permit issuers, as permit receivers, as performing authorities, and all those things. And it makes the is the it makes everything very seamless. So what I'm trying to say is that, yeah, digitalization is the way to go and that I want to encourage everybody to embrace it and then find ways to help us work safer in a more digital world. Thank you so much, everybody. All right. Thank you, sir, for that comment. We appreciate that. Mr. Obon, please unmute now and speak. You raise your hand again. Mr. Obon, can you hear me now? Okay. Mr. Obon? Okay, so this is the end of the day. We don't have any other person that raised their hand, so we have to move to the closing remarks. Mr. Ario, please give the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have just about 66 people on the call. We would like to run at some point. We want to appreciate everyone for taking time to join. We are doing a very valuable session, and I believe we are doing a lot of work. A lot of information as well as one that you have to accept for the for organization. To ensure that the recording is uh, shared with us as, as much as possible. And then for those that want to do their payment for membership in you and so on and so forth, please let's contact um, the central executive to assist us in that. That's what I want to say. Thank you once again for joining. Enjoy the rest of the day. And then Happy start to all the Christian house. Thank you very much and God bless. Thank you for the turn back. It's over and out for the bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.